Hey everybody, this is the general topic analysis for January, February. Uh, resolved, the United States ought not provide military aid to authoritarian regimes. This was one of the topics that I was most happy uh, would be available for JanFeb, in the sense that uh, while this one wasn't necessarily my favorite, this one was way better than most of them. So it's pretty exciting to get the chance to work with you all on this one. Uh, the reading I've been doing so far has been a lot of fun, and I think this one is going to be the best topic of the year, no question, and one that we as a team will be very good on. So with that said, uh, let's get started. I'm going to be going through the resolution and the terms of the resolution, first and foremost. Then I'm going to be going through some common affirmatives that I think are going to pop up and common affirmative arguments, and then things that don't necessarily fall under common affirmatives, but things that I think are worth mentioning. So when we get there, specify further. The negative is going to be the common negative arguments that I'm seeing so far, and then how I would recommend approaching specific affirmatives on this topic. I think we will be doing very well on prepping against specific affirmatives. But there's going to be some overarching recommendations I'm going to make here that on a topic like this are quite valuable. So the resolution. The United States is the first term that I'm going to talk about here. I don't think this one is especially complicated. It is the United States government is what is meant by the United States. Uh, so things like 50 states will probably not be viable for the most part on this topic because it's an international topic rather than domestic. Uh, and we're going to be seeing a lot of state action that is just going to be the states collectively being defended uh, through the federal government or through the three branches and people not necessarily specifying Congress, executive, or courts, right? So they're just going to say the United States government and then move on, which is something to keep in mind that we should be taking advantage of because when they do that, uh, they're not being as clear as they could be. So... Uh, the power of the purse is something that should be considered here. This kind of ties into who determines where the money goes. The power of the purse is Congress's ability to determine where budgeting goes, how much money goes where, why that money goes there. So Congress determines how much money goes towards foreign aid, right? And that's foreign aid overall. And some specific bit goes to military aid and also known as security assistance, right? Um... The question who determines where the money goes is where things kind of change. Uh, the people in charge that I have seen so far are the State Department and the Pentagon have control over the budget and handling the budget with specificity. So this made me ask the question, well, could we technically defend an affirmative that says this five-star general that has power in the Pentagon should stop this program because it's under his jurisdiction? I think there are some grounds to say that that is plausible. There's two things to say about that. Number one is why. Uh, I don't really see many reasons why we would be doing that as the affirmative or why that would be valuable for the affirmative. Uh, it would require some very deep research and something super specific having actually been written to even consider it valuable. Uh, and any of that stuff is probably classified, <laughs> if it does exist. Uh, and the second thing there is that uh, I just don't really think that it's plausible as an actor. I, I don't think that's a proper way of determining the United States. So it wouldn't win the definitional element for me, which makes me think that the United States really just means the executive and Congress when we get specific, but it just means the federal government. So that's who you're going to be seeing defending things for the most part. I don't think people will clarify State Department or Pentagon. Uh, and if they do, it won't be too convincing. That's the United States. The next is ought not provide. This is going to be fairly quick. My intuition asks, well, listen, does ought not provide food, for example, mean that we should give no food? And um, I think... In general, yes, there's um, there's 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 a there's a degree of open-endedness here, but it's not that strong, right? And that uh, 
I think it is a very fair interpretation to say that when we say ought not provide military aid, we're not providing any military aid. Right? So that's something that needs to be considered here, is do we, by ought not provide, mean that we provide less aid or no aid? Right? So there is a great intuitive argument that says it is no aid to this country. Right? But I think it's fair to say that we can specify. For example, ought not provide weapon credits. Right? By weapon credits, I mean subsidizing weapon purchases to Saudi Arabia, right? That seems to be not providing military aid, right? It's not all forms of military aid, but it is not providing military aid, right? So while I can't say I have a, a, a grammatical take on this, I do think that there is um, space on both sides here and that you should be ready to defend specific military aid and argue that you can't defend specific military aid. Uh, this is something that you should be fairly well prepped on by the end of this topic, and you should be fairly confident that you know on both sides. So I ought not provide a little bit more depth than I expected, um, but I don't think there's anything beyond this. The next is military aid. Uh, military aid is not too complicated. The State Department, the Pentagon, and the general definitions are quite specific in this regard. Uh, what it looks like now is about $50 billion per year going to, to going to foreign aid, as far as I have seen, and a subset of that going to military aid, or roughly $50 billion going to military aid. Uh, it's like 0.2% of the federal budget, maybe a tad higher. It's not very high in terms of the overarching U.S. economy, but when you give $70 billion to a third world country, that's fairly impressive, right? So that's just kind of an example of it's fairly high impact for the, don uh, for the recipient countries, but not for us as a donor. Uh, so what counts and what doesn't count, all definitions that I've been seeing, and you'll find a ton of them in our card files, are money, and they clarify grants or loans. Right. So it doesn't just have to be a loan. It could be something that I've seen called concessionary aid, uh, which is that you just give people the money with no strings attached. Uh, in terms of, of what they owe you back, I'm sure there are some diplomatic and political strings, right? But explicitly, uh, there is no strings attached to some of the aid. Um, so money. Another one is weapons. These are fairly obvious. Equipment, training. Right, bringing them officers to train stuff. Here's one that's a little less obvious, is using our military for their benefit. So imagine that the United States puts a fleet into the Pacific to help the Philippines stop China from pushing into contested territory. Right? So the Philippines and China have contested territory. Would that be military aid? It seems to me that that would be military aid um, because it is in a certain respect equipment. My question is, uh, is this military aid something that we give them? And what I mean by that is that we have to hand it over to them and give them control over it. If that is the ticket for what is military aid and what isn't, then troop deployments or fleet maneuvers or changing where our weapon systems are pointed wouldn't be military aid. Uh, this is one of those that's not as clear either. I think doing more research would help me clear it up, but ultimately I think there are two sides to the story. One that says that there could be deployments and U.S. military usage is topical and that there couldn't be. Uh, this will be another hot point. I don't think this one will be as big of a deal as ought not provide, uh, but it is something to consider, right? Because if we can reposition the Eighth Fleet, that would be a very interesting affirmative uh, if it falls under military aid. So not much more there. Um, oh, one thing to note is that counter-narcotics is considered military aid and counter-terror, right? So we gave a lot of money to Colombia to stop drugs and Afghanistan under the guise of stopping drugs. So kind of a cool, more niche element of military aid. I think it's, 
name is called non-military security assistance, but it falls under the umbrella of military aid. So those are some things to consider. I would do more in-depth research on military aid, but a lot of the literature is just general. It's like military aid, and they don't specify too much uh, as far as I've seen. Uh, the next one is authoritarian regimes. As you can see from these definitions, the first one, the term authoritarian regimes in its broadest sense encompasses all forms of undemocratic rule. This is not the clearest term the world's ever seen. Uh, that is not to say that it is unclear, right? That would be wrong. There's a lot of work done by scholars to clarify, for example, the difference between totalitarian regime and authoritarian regime, right? Or how, what kinds of undemocratic rule make you authoritarian? Right? So it's not necessarily to say that it is not clear, but there's a lot of wiggle room here. Right? And there are some competing definitions, and there are some competing claims that make it possible to make arguments for why a country is an authoritarian regime, and uh, it probably isn't in terms of being objective. Right? Uh, the next thing is who we support now to kind of get an idea of... Uh, what the topic looks like. This is a quote I pulled from a Truthout article uh, that says that we support 73% of the dictatorships in the world, and it was specific to military aid. Uh, it translated to about 36 countries. Um, this is another reason why uh, it's not entirely clear, because right, what kind of aid becomes military aid then impacts certain countries, and then uh, are they authoritarian regimes or not is the second question, right? All of that to say that it's not entirely clear. However, there's a lot of affirmative ground here. There are a lot of countries that we help that are definitely authoritarian regimes. Um, there's just, there's just, there's just so many different specific options for the affirmative to pull from. So it's going to be really hard to argue, uh, that there aren't specific affirmatives, uh, that is false. There are so many affirmatives to choose from. And that's because we help, I would say, 20 plus countries, which would consistently check out as authoritarian regimes. This definitely merits more research on you all's part um, and is going to be a clash point. But there are going to be some times where the app is blatantly correct in the, t the regime it chooses. Um, one thing I'm going to cover a little more on the next page, but you should be ready for now, is the question of specificity. Can you choose one of those specific affirmatives? I think we all collectively agree yes as coaches. I am a hard yes in that regard, but you're going to constantly see some pushback on that. So it is worth looking into how much specificity is acceptable. That's the resolution. There's not too much to add. I think it's fairly solid. The terms are pretty straightforward overall, and um, there are not going to be too many tricky T debates. For example, on right to privacy, the right to privacy was a little harder to pin down, and a lot of people were misinterpreting it. That's not going to happen here. The affirmative. I have listed out what I think are the most common affirmatives and the ones that are most intuitive. I started with the critical one. The first is imperialism. This argument's fairly easy to piece together. Uh, the United States uses military aid to impose itself on the rest of the world, and that's a bad thing. Right? The U.S. should mind its own business, shouldn't determine what countries should and shouldn't get, right? Should not be a hegemon, right? So, I think this is going to be a lovely hegemony, bad hegemony, good debate every single time. Uh, and that's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Um, another one is going to be a more general, holistic, kind of traditional approach, which is just like we shouldn't support regimes, Right, the United States should uh, pose itself as better than that, right? As above giving regimes any form of support. Um, so that argument is just going to be that authoritarian regimes, despite security concerns, whatever, don't need support. Uh, a more, a less traditional take would be like removing support is uh, the first step in collapsing these regimes, right? But uh, I think you're going to see some some generic regimes bad. The next one is generic impacts. This is obviously not too specific, but I'll list now. Things like our military aid being used for abuses, things like uh, military aid being used to support terrorism, things like countries 
using our military aid against our own interests. Things like military aid just straight up doesn't work, which a lot of literature defends. Uh, those are going to be things you should expect. There's going to be a litany of different reasons why military aid is bad. Just as there will be a litany of reasons why it's good. But I think if I had to choose a side that had more flexibility in terms of arguments, i.e. there was a more diverse range of arguments to choose from, it would be the affirmative. Because uh, they have a lot of different reasons why military aid may be bad. And military aid is defended for very few reasons, all being fairly strong reasons. The last one is going to be libertarianism type arguments. Um, the S, believe it or not, is another money sign. Ignore the typo. Um, these arguments are going to be like, why are we spending money on these other countries? It's going to be like isolationist arguments for why our tax dollars shouldn't be thrown into this conflict time and time again. Uh, I think this one's kind of compelling on a philosophical level. Uh, and people are going to go for it, and they're going to say our taxes shouldn't be used for other countries. Uh, Rand Paul very explicitly has argued against military aid for Saudi Arabia. right? So the libertarians, at least in certain respects, definitely side against uh, military aid as we do it now. So that's something to think about. These are things to consider next. The whole resolution is going to be really tough to defend. I'm going to go more in depth on that and the neg, but it's really hard to just win that holistically military aid is bad. Uh, I, I just don't see you getting too far with that in most instances. I think it's fine to have if you're going heavily for those generic impacts, right, and you've got stellar evidence. But if not, you should be prepared to specify to a degree. One thing that we talked about a few days ago in the JanFeb Slack channel was the domestic affirmatives. This is kind of fun. Um, here's a question that I have for you. Is the United States an authoritarian regime? Right. If an argument can be made for why that is true, right? and believe me, those arguments have been made right? uh, time and time again, then presumably right, the U.S. should not give military aid to itself. Well, what does that mean? Right? That would also require stretching the definition of military aid because military aid considers an external actor with the current definition, right? We aid other countries. But the definition could also be stretched to say that we shouldn't aid our own country. The next question is, well, what kind of military aid, if we were to stretch the definition of military aid, do we provide now? I think there are two almost convincing arguments. The first is the military itself. Uh, Congress provides aid to the military by passing budgets. So, Kind of nifty idea is like a defunding the military affirmative that says, well, we shouldn't provide aid to our military. We should stop sending in any money, All right? And the other one is the police. Um, the police have gotten a lot of military equipment post the uh, heavy deployments of the early 20th century war that we've been having. Or I suppose wars is more uh, is more is more correct. Right? So the police have got a lot of military equipment now and military level training and the like. So an argument could absolutely be made for why that is something that we should end. Um, my point here isn't necessarily that I think these are topical affirmatives, but that these are things that are going to come up on the circuit. And uh, we plan to write as well. Right? So do recognize that there's some room to stretch definitions, as was talked about in the resolution, and this is a pretty great example of how extreme that can get. Uh, the next thing to prepare for is process debates. I'm not going to get too much on this on this slide. I'll go on when I go to the neg. Uh, process debates being you have to determine why you choose the actor you do. Why Congress? Right? Why the executive? Uh, you need to be ready for your mechanism, right? For example, if your argument is we should just end all aid with a bill, you might get hit with politics. Right? So there's some space for a process debate here that needs to be considered. It's going to be one of the more interesting negative approaches. Uh, and getting hit with an in-depth um, process, counterplan, disad combo, right, is going to be pretty tough to be ready for if we haven't considered all the options. So that's something to keep in mind. The next and last thing is the negative. The common negatives, the first one is obvious, it's hegemony. Uh, 
All right, this is why I meant when the negative has much less argument diversity. Hegemony is the point of military aid. We give aid to people because we want them to be loyal to the United States when the United States need them. All right, and we give aid to them to stop things that are hurting the United States. So I could probably drone on and on about the number of ways hegemony functions on the negative. Right? For example, troop deployments, or giving equipment, or posturing, right? soft power versus hard power. There's so much to talk about here. And this is going to be the crux of the negative. So your hegemony files are going to be huge by February. Another one is going to be plan inclusive counterplans. This gets into why I think the whole res is pretty not viable. Uh, if you say ban all military aid, they could stand up and say do the F except for Lebanon or Colombia. Or, uh, I don't know, Honduras, right? These are all arguments for why uh, whole resolutions are going to be slammed time and time again by plan inclusive counterplans. And if, even if it, they don't use plan inclusive counterplans, the NEG has really specific links to disads. So they could just read a disadvantage to Lebanon. And now all of a sudden you're weighing your generic impacts against a really, really specific war argument that uh, is going to pan out in a nuclear war and you're going to be struggling, right? Because the link work is going to be fairly good, even if they don't read a plan and close a counter plan. So one of the big things for the negative here, another thing to realize is it's not just certain countries that are getting picked out of, right? You could argue, for example, if they say ban weapon sales to Saudi Arabia, you could say do the F, but don't ban small arm sales, right? The point here is that there's specific forms of military aid you could also pick out of, which I think is going to be very interesting to watch, right? And things that the negatives research uh, is going to be a lot of fun to do because you just have to be hyper-specific as a negative to beat back the specificity of the AF to a certain degree. Here's one that I was considering. I don't know how much there is to back this up, but a nuanced critique of imperialism, the critique type uh, uh, topic analysis should go into this a bit more. But the point is that there's an argument to be made against the U.S., like just pulling aid and deciding aid, right, on its own whims, right, and being able to lord over the rest of the world and say, okay, we're going to give you money, and now we're not going to give you money, right? The argument could be like... You, as the affirmative, doing this, pulling aid from this country, while isn't necessarily a bad thing, speaks to a larger imperialism, right? Where the U.S. has the ability to be paternalistic. By paternalistic, I mean, like, it feels like it's in charge, right? Over other countries. And this criticism would argue that you're deciding that aid is something that we should even be able to do in the first place is a problem. So it's going to be fairly critical. Um... And I don't really know how much depth there is to find there, but this is something to, to mull over, right? Because the critical arguments definitely side affirmative for the most part. Um, so the negative has to get a bit creative. The next is going to be aid good. This checks back against the generic impacts. It also shows that there's going to be a lot of case turns to go for. That's just like aid is good here, aid is good for this. Like without aid, we're going to lose humanitarian aid or like aid spillover. Right, so I mean, I, I I would not be surprised at all if we could put together a seven-minute NC of case turns to certain affirmatives. Right, so you're going to see a lot of case turns and case arguments getting dumped um, on both sides. Just just going to be so much specific stuff. Um, you might be wondering, right? How do I handle specific affirmatives? Right? How do I deal with an F that's like stop giving Israel? Uh, AK-47s, right? Your well, number one is going to be research, right? That example is obviously absurdly difficult, right? But um, you're going to have to be on the ball with research. Got to know the the way this works inside and out. That's the only way to keep up with a lot of the specificity. The neg prep burden is going to be high. That's undeniable. Um, I don't really have to, to beat the dead horse on that because you've always heard us saying research, research, research. But this is the type of topic you don't just stop researching in the middle of January. You're researching, you know, every day. The next is specificity theory. What I mean by that is just you should not be able to specify. Uh, every single debate is going to have at least one of these shells, I think, to a degree. So that that's going to be an obvious argument, right? Like handling specificity, for example. The common one is Nebel T, right? The generic phrases. 
don't deserve specificity when you interpret them. Uh, it's just going to be a never-ending specificity debate for this topic, and that's fine, but that just means that you have to be ready. This gets back to the process debate. The negative should be creative on some process counter plans and stuff. For example, the executive, right? Or the State Department should get its funding pulled, or the Pentagon should get its funding pulled, except for um, like this specific nuclear proliferation research, right? It's that type of process counter plans that make uh, for really, really interesting debates and is going to uh, help beat back this lack of argument diversity that the negative has on the core of the topic. Um, so this is going to be a big thing. And then some handy generics. This gets back to the common negs. Uh, hegemony arguments, some good counter plans that you can impact to pretty much every affirmative, right? Some kind of critique that'll work against most affirmatives. And then things like, you know, specificity theory are going to be very valuable for being the negative of this debate. Uh, because you're going to be beating back specific apps that are just going to get more and more specific as we get deeper and deeper into the topic. Uh, that's a trend that I don't see uh, reversing. And that is all. I think that covers most of the specifics, I, uh, or most of the general specifics, I should say, because I didn't get too specific here. Um, I'm really excited for this topic, if you can't tell. I think there's a lot to talk about. I think we're going to be pretty much nonstop mulling over new options for the next two months. So the research does not end here. Um, and hopefully you enjoy this topic as much as I do, and hopefully this topic analysis was helpful to you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me, of course, or to the coaches uh, as a whole. Uh, so I hope that helped. Best of luck with JamFab.